Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University, and I'm delighted to welcome you all back to our virtual discussions with Genuine Expert series. We initiated these webinars last April as the COVID-19 pandemic was taking hold globally and beginning to have profound impact in the United States. Few could have imagined the incredible toll in human lives or how our world would be transformed. Our goal then and now is to share what we scientists are learning at the forefront of COVID-19 research at the Rockefeller University and beyond. Today's webinar is our first session this fall, and I'm particularly pleased to be joined by my friend and colleague, Sir John Bell from Oxford University. Welcome, John. Since the World Health Organization has declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern in January, the scientific community in academia, biotech, and pharma has been engaged in a race to understand the biology of the virus, understand how it causes disease, and devise ways to prevent infection and or mitigate the effects of infection. In the last months, a few new therapeutic approaches have been shown to be efficacious, including the drug remdesivir, which inhibits viral replication, and corticosteroids like dexamethasone, which are potent anti-inflammatory drugs that reduce death in a subset of severely ill patients. Many other treatments are in or nearing clinical trials, including use of convalescent plasma from patients who have recovered from the virus, use of antibodies that specifically target the part of the viral protein used by the virus to enter cells, and other drug therapies. While all these approaches have great potential, from the outset, the holy grail has been to develop vaccines that can provide long-lasting immunity from new infection. It is not surprising, therefore, that more than 100 companies have been engaged in the race to develop effective vaccines for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There are now 29 vaccines in clinical trials, including seven in phase three efficacy trials. Three of these are thought to be most advanced and promising, and this includes the vaccine candidate developed by the Jenner Institute at Oxford University that is being developed in collaboration with the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. John Bell is at the helm of Oxford's and the UK's response to COVID-19, and his background in immunity, medicine, and basic science make him the ideal person to tell us about the race to a vaccine today. Aside from our shared interest in COVID-19, as great bastions of biomedical science, Rockefeller and Oxford are bedfellows who are fortunate to share a number of benefactors in common. Throughout the pandemic, there has been a remarkable outpouring of philanthropic support for the essential work on SARS-CoV-2 to spur the development of preventive and therapeutic agents. In this area, Oxford and Rockefeller are fortunate to share two wonderful benefactors, both of whom I would like to thank. We're grateful to our generous corporate benefactor, Bulgari. Through its virus-free fund, Bulgari is now supporting young scientists and COVID-19 research at both Rockefeller and Oxford. Here at Rockefeller, the Bulgari Women in Science Fund to Accelerate COVID-19 Research has created nine Bulgari Women in Science Fellowships for women graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. In addition, the Bulgari Clinical Fund will advance the development and clinical testing of new drugs, vaccines, and other therapies to combat COVID-19 and related coronavirus strains. At Oxford, Bulgari is supporting vaccine development at the Jenner Institute and funding scholarships for doctoral students working in vaccine research. Our two institutions share another generous partner. I'm speaking of Julian Robertson, who's a spectacular benefactor to our two institutions. Rockefeller has been fortunate to have had the Robertson Foundation's generous support of many initiatives over the years. And in keeping with his other transformational contributions, Julian has made a major contribution to our COVID-19 research for which we're deeply grateful. I'd like to mention that the president of the Robertson Foundation for the last 11 years has been John Hood, a wonderful partner who had previously been chancellor of no other than Oxford University. Last week, John Hood announced his retirement uh, upcoming this next January. And I'd like to thank uh, John today to thank him for all he has done for Rockefeller and for biomedical science over these many years at the helm of the Robertson Foundation. Thank you, John. Now, before John Bell joins me to discuss the Oxford vaccine and work, other work underway in the UK, I'll give you a brief update on the COVID-19 pandemic since our last webinar. So this shows where we left off uh, last spring. This is from the Johns Hopkins website. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that at that time, this was dated uh, June 17th, 
There at that time were 8 million uh, confirmed cases to the right under global deaths, uh, half a million uh, global deaths. And then down the left-hand side, you can see that at that time, there were 2 million cases in the US followed by Brazil, Russia, India, and the UK, and dropping off uh, below 300,000 cases uh, in each country uh, after that. And at that time, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that at that time, there were a maximum of 150,000 new cases per day. And the next slide shows how uh, that picture has changed since then. The global picture has increased the number of cases from 8 million to, to over 31 million over the last several months. The number of deaths has doubled to nearly a million. Uh, and uh, uh, the US today passed a grim milestone with as of this afternoon, there are now more than 200,000 deaths uh, from coronavirus, doubling what we had uh, last spring. And the number of cases has, inc has increased from 2 million to over 6 million. And in the global picture, there are now over 300,000 cases per day. We're not winning this battle at this point, uh, either in the US or globally. A major contributor to the growth of cases uh, over the last several months has been India, which has gone from uh, a small fraction of cases, only several hundred thousand uh, last spring, uh, to now over 5 million uh, cases, and they're contributing about 90,000 uh, cases per day. So the pandemic is continuing to run its course in various waves uh, around the world. Uh, and as I was discussing with John before we got started, the UK is in the midst of uh, a surge in cases uh, across the nation uh, as well. So this shows where we are uh, in daily cases per 100,000 people, which I think is particularly informative uh, because it makes the case that we are doing really miserably in the United States. Uh, th this shows uh, cases in the United States and then to the right across South America, where the case number per 100,000 per day is similar, about 13 cases per 100,000 people. In the U.S., that's uh, now over 40,000 cases per day, uh, going back up after coming down from the peak uh, that uh, we hit in the summer with uh, the surge in cases in Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Uh, uh, and, uh, but when you look at uh, the rest of the world, uh, Central and South Asia, very low number of cases. Europe and Russia, compared to the United States, very low, ha about half the number of cases uh, per 100,000. And it gets lower as you go across North Africa, the rest of North America, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and East Asia, which is particularly low. This is not just cases that are of no consequence. Uh, the next slide shows that it's closely paralleled by the number of deaths uh, daily per 100,000 people. Uh, and again, the US is uh, uh, leading uh, the world in uh, uh, the overall death rate uh, uh, in the US uh, as, as a total number of people and is very high on the deaths uh, per 100,000 or deaths per million. Uh, but again, I would point out uh, the very low apparent death rates in Sub-Saharan Africa and in East Asia. And again, although we were seeing a decline in death in, in both cases and deaths that was rather precipitous uh, over the last month, uh, these numbers have started to tick back up again. Just shows the top of the list of uh, the number in the pink uh, highlighted section uh, is the deaths per million population. And this is the top of the list uh, in descending order. And you can see that, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. is number 10 and the U.K. Uh, is number 11, uh, with over, each with over 600 deaths uh, per million people in total over the duration of uh, the pandemic. But this is not uh, the case universally. This slide shows the average number of cases, which is closely paralleled uh, by deaths across the globe. And a couple of elements to point out is first in Southeast Asia, uh, the number of cases and the number of deaths is uh, a paltry fraction of what we have uh, in much of Western Europe uh, and the United States and South America. Uh, so, and, and this is paralleled by deaths. It is remarkable that in Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and the rest of Southeast Asia, the deaths per million individuals is tiny, less than one per million uh, compared to uh, uh, the uh, fraction that the numbers that I just showed you uh, of uh, 600 per million total uh, in the United States. Uh, similarly, Sub-Saharan Africa appears to have an unusually low death rate. It's hard to account for all of these. Kenya is probably the best, 
uh, and they're reporting fewer than eight deaths per million in their hospitals are surely not getting overrun uh, by the pandemic uh, the way uh, everyone anticipated in the spring uh, Sub-Saharan Africa might be. The one outlier there is at the bottom of Africa, South Africa uh, has uh, a more typical uh, rate of disease and of death, uh, more similar to Europe uh, than the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so there's very striking heterogeneity uh, in, ver in particular parts of the globe uh, that uh, are, seem to have much lower death rates as well as much lower uh, uh, case rates, in the, certainly in the case of Southeast Asia. This just uh, drives home the point that the United States has not done an effective job uh, in uh, suppressing the virus across the country. So in red is the curve of the number of daily cases in the United States and in blue uh, is the curve uh, co uh, co collectively across all of Europe. And you can see that uh, we had a similar number of cases in March and April with the US slightly behind uh, uh, temporally in the cases that were uh, seen in Europe. But whereas Europe managed to suppress the virus very quite effectively for a substantial period of time through May, June, uh, July, and the beginning of August, uh, we never got the virus levels down across the country. So the, while some parts of the country were getting uh, much better at uh, uh, lower levels of infection, uh, they were compensated by rising in uh, levels in other parts of the country. So we never really got to a low, an effectively low level. And then as you can see in July and August, the case rate really took off, uh, uh, particularly across the South, and then started to come down again. And now it's starting to head back up uh, once more. This shows the uh, percent positive tests for the virus across the US, which I think is a nice way of uh, looking at the data because it does not depend as uh, drastically on how many tests you do. So if you do a tenth as many tests, you can fool yourself and say that you've got a tenth as many cases a, as a neighboring state that is doing 10 times as many tests, but has the same percent uh, positivity. And uh, there are several notable sections in the country. In the Northeast, uh, in, in the uh, blue-green color, that's less than 5% of all tests are positive. And across most of the Northeast, in fact, that number is around 1%. In New York, it has been uh, uh, less than 1% for uh, uh, the last several months. Vermont is uh, about a half a percent. Maine is similar. Uh, and New Hampshire and Massachusetts also are very low. Uh, and Connecticut and New Jersey are not far behind. Uh, the states that really took off this summer, Florida and uh, uh, Texas and Arizona, have come down from their peaks of 20% positive test rates. Florida is still over 10%. Uh, Texas is now about 8%. Arizona is also still greater than 5%. But there are new clusters of case states that uh, have uh, uh, higher levels of positivity and higher case levels. Uh, and uh, these include the uh, other states in light orange and uh, darker orange, which are greater than 10% and greater than 15% positive rates. So Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, uh, Kansas, South Dakota are all greater than 15% positive rates. Uh, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, Missouri are all greater than uh, 10%, uh, as is uh, Alabama. And the uh, states in yellow are greater than 5%, but less than 10%. So we still have many states with very high levels of uh, uh, viral activity, uh, some that are continuing to go up, uh, a few that are coming down, uh, but then other states that are remaining stable uh, at relatively low levels. This shows the data for New York City, uh, which is quite uh, striking. We went through a, a really catastrophic period, as uh, everyone knows, uh, early on, where we were having uh, on the order of uh, uh, th thousands of cases uh, presenting per day in the upper left, uh, and we're now down to uh, only 250 to 300 new cases per day for a population of uh, uh, 8 million people. Uh, on the right-hand panel at the top is the number of new hospitalizations per day. 
uh, which had been as high as 1,500 hospitalizations per day, and it's currently been stable uh, uh, since the end of June uh, at 20 to 30 new hospitalizations uh, per day. And the number of deaths, uh, which peaked at about a little over 500 uh, deaths per day due to COVID-19 in uh, uh, the peak of the pandemic, uh, has been stable at less than uh, 10 deaths per day uh, for the last several months. Uh, and the positivity rate, as I said, is uh, less than 1%. So uh, this has been uh, extraordinarily promising, good evidence that uh, maintaining social distancing, frequent hand washing and wearing masks uh, is very effective at uh, preventing infection uh, and has made New York uh, one of the safest places to be uh, in the country right now. So what else is uh, new since uh, we last met in the spring? Well, the demographics uh, of the pandemic are largely unchanged. Uh, this still is a disease that uh, infects men and women roughly equally, but men uh, die more frequently than women do. We find similarly that uh, people from uh, the Hispanic community and black individuals uh, have again, slightly increased rate of infection compared to uh, others, uh, but a markedly higher uh, rate of uh, death. Uh, and most importantly, uh, this is a, the, the rate of death is highly age dependent. So uh, about 90% of all deaths occur in individuals who are over uh, 55 years of age. Uh, and uh, the fraction of people who get infected uh, who die from the virus uh, increases uh, with each uh, decade of life uh, thereafter. Uh, the, the fraction of people who get seriously ill or die uh, under age uh, 30 is uh, uh, quite uh, rare, uh, but not unheard of uh, as the numbers have gone up. We have recognized uh, not just that uh, young children can be infected, uh, but a small fraction of them could have uh, a death as an outcome uh, of their infections. We've also learned that the simple prevention measures that we've been talking about and banging the drum uh, for the last several months uh, are truly effective. Uh, wearing a mask turns out to be very effective at preventing the spread of the virus. Uh, and there's uh, increasing evidence that if you do get infected while wearing a mask, you have likely reduced the dose of the virus that uh, you are exposed to, and that may make the, the virus uh, less severe in your case than it otherwise uh, would have been. There is strong evidence that uh, continues to increase of transmission by aerosols. Uh, and this has been a matter of some controversy in the US over the last several days as the FDA uh, put this up on their website and then promptly took it down for reasons that they're having a hard time explaining. Uh, but they say it wasn't properly uh, uh, vetted. Uh, but uh, this evidence is nonetheless uh, uh, quite compelling with uh, some of the super spreader events that have occurred in indoor spaces that are poorly ventilated. Uh, and this, uh, of course, is a matter of some concern that we want to make sure that if you're going to be in a large group indoors, that that space should be very well ventilated uh, with the turnover of uh, the number of uh, the, the air that comes into the room should only go out of the room and not be recirculated uh, back into the room. Uh, we now have good evidence that children can transmit uh, uh, the infection, which uh, was somewhat uncertain uh, last spring. Uh, there have been advances in testing and contact tracing that I'll return to. Uh, there's new data that have uh, uh, further supported uh, therapeutics. Remdesivir and corticosteroids like dexamethasone are uh, effective in treating uh, subsets of patients. And as we'll see uh, from John, there's abundant data on uh, the potential efficacy of uh, vaccines. One uh, uh, potential change that uh, could be of uh, great uh, uh, importance going forward, uh, we have mentioned uh, repeatedly the challenge in getting testing up to the levels uh, required. And this uh, has continued to be a challenge throughout the summer uh, where uh, testing was sufficiently stretched that uh, many people had to wait uh, for a week, one to two weeks to get results of testing. Uh, at which point the test is of uh, essentially no value uh, in uh, trying to prevent chains of transmission by isolating patients for sure, and is not of great value to the affected individual uh, uh, either. So a, uh, the U.S. has managed to increase its testing substantially, roughly doubling it to now uh, nearly 900,000 uh, tests being done per day. Uh, but uh, uh, 
uh, I and others have advocated that uh, much larger testing needs to be done since we recognize that about 40% of all cases are asymptomatic and aren't going to come forward for testing uh, unless they're a, a contact of a known case. So uh, just in the last several weeks, uh, lateral flow tests have started to become available. This slide shows one of these. This is like a home pregnancy test uh, where you take a swab of uh, your uh, oropharynx or nasopharynx, uh, uh, dip it into uh, a, a, a solution, put a spot of the solution on the right-hand uh, uh, cup, uh, and uh, let this lateral flow process proceed uh, with addition of antibodies uh, against the virus uh, that can be detected in the uh, uh, striped area of uh, the lateral flow test. One stripe is a control labeled C and the other is labeled T. And like a home pregnancy test, if you have the virus, uh, you get a red stripe uh, at the test position. Uh, these tests uh, need to be reasonably sensitive and specific, uh, and there's promise that this uh, might be the case uh, that would make him useful at least for uh, testing whether you are capable of transmitting the virus, uh, maybe somewhat less sensitive for saying whether you actually uh, have the virus uh, uh, at this point. Uh, but this, uh, these can be done uh, quite readily. They're very inexpensive cartridges. Uh, these really begin to meet the uh, uh, need for being able to uh, do millions of tests. Uh, and both Abbott and Roche and several other companies uh, have tests that they believe they can distribute 50 million of these tests per month uh, uh, in the coming months that would begin to address uh, the need for more pervasive ability <clears throat> to test uh, uh, in large numbers at will. So I just wanted to give a, a brief update on some of the progress uh, from uh, COVID-19 research at uh, Rockefeller. As I've uh, discussed before, uh, Rockefeller uh, had no one working on COVID-19 when the pandemic uh, uh, started. 25 of our laboratories pivoted to uh, do projects uh, related to uh, uh, the virus. And uh, shown here are some of uh, the contributions that have been made. One of our earliest contributions was to help the New York Blood Center set up convalescent uh, uh, plasma testing. Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, done in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Barry Kohler, Paul Benash, and Theodora uh, Hatsinolu, uh, shown at the top of uh, the slide, who developed antibody tests to identify who is most likely to have uh, a useful convalescent plasma for uh, infusion. And we helped the New York Blood Center uh, get going. They've now distributed more than 70,000 convalescent uh, plasmas that have been infused into patients. Unfortunately, most of these have uh, not been done in controlled clinical trials, so we don't know with certainty from uh, work in the U.S. yet uh, whether convalescent plasma uh, is useful or not. And this is the, the downside of emergency use authorization uh, because it inhibits people from uh, going into uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, Michelle uh, uh, Nussenzweig and uh, uh, and his laboratory have uh, gone on to uh, uh, do with uh, the clinical work being done by Marina Kasky, shown on this slide, uh, cloning neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein. Uh, these have been published uh, in prominent papers in Cell. Uh, they have very potent uh, monoclonal antibodies that uh, in combination are very effective at neutralizing the virus. Uh, and these are being scaled up by Bristol-Myers Squibb, who is making a ton, literally a ton of these antibodies uh, for clinical trial <clears throat> and potential rollout uh, as uh, uh, prophylactic agents and or therapeutic agents uh, against the virus. Uh, down uh, below, Michael Rout and uh, Brian Chait have uh, cloned out nanobodies made by llamas. Nanobodies are, uh, have just the combining part of antibody molecules. So they're very small, very compact, uh, and consequently very stable. And they've made extremely potent antibodies to the spike protein that might in fact be extremely effective for uh, uh, home use for uh, testing as well as potential for therapeutics. Uh, shown in the lower left, Jean-Laurent Casanova uh, has studied uh, rare, looking for rare mutations that cause severe outcome from uh, 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 the virus. These rare mutations are in the host genome, and he has two papers coming out back to back in science day after tomorrow uh, that will report the fascinating results of uh, these studies uh, and the directions that they point to for uh, potential therapeutics. 
uh, Charlie Rice has uh, developed uh, 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 host genes that are required, uh, has been able to use CRISPR screens to identify host genes that are required for the viral life cycle. Uh, and uh, uh, next is uh, Elizabeth Campbell and Seth Darst and Tarun Kapoor, who've done beautiful work uh, looking at the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 viral uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is how the virus replicates, and the helicase that unwinds the double-stranded RNA uh, intermediate that allows replication to uh, continue. Uh, and turns out to be tightly bound to uh, the polymerase in this process uh, and provides interesting insight into potential targets uh, for therapeutics uh, that uh, Tarun is working on to try to develop uh, helicase inhibitors since helicase is an essential enzyme for the virus. Uh, sh next over is uh, Tom Tushel, who has been doing drug screens for inhibitors of uh, the polymerase and helicase that uh, have a lot of promise. And then uh, to the far right is Bob Darnell, who has uh, uh, established uh, uh, testing on campus that has enabled us to open our uh, uh, children's school uh, and uh, has streamlined uh, viral testing, uh, developing a highly sensitive uh, saliva-based test, which is ideal uh, for young children. Uh, and uh, has developed protocols that enable uh, high levels of pooling uh, of samples that uh, make the test uh, uh, g have far greater reach uh, than it would otherwise uh, have and will enable us to uh, test large numbers of individuals uh, uh, who are coming to campus on a regular basis. So this is uh, an update uh, rather quickly on what we've been up to over the last uh, couple of months. And now I'd like to uh, return to uh, the highlight of uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, and I, it's my pleasure to formally introduce Sir John Bell, the Regis Professor of Medicine at the University of Oxford. John's own research has focused on immunology and medical genetics, and he's made vital contributions to our understanding of autoimmune diseases, such as type one diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. John grew up in Canada and went to the UK initially as a Rhodes Scholar and stayed on for medical training. He went on to fellowship at Stanford University and returned to the UK in 1987, where he's been a visionary leader in biomedical science. Uh, John's tremendous breadth, insight, and good taste have made him extremely influential in the UK biomedical community and beyond. Among his many contributions in 1993, he founded the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics at Oxford. He served as president of the UK's Academy of Medical Sciences from 2006 to 2011 and chaired the Office for the Strategic Coordination of Health Research at the National Health Service for more than 15 years until 2017. He sits on the board of Genomics England and chairs the Science Advisory Committee. In December 2011, John was named one of two UK life science champions by the Prime Minister, under which he wrote the 2017 UK Life Sciences Industrial Strategy. John has chaired the Gates Foundation Global Health Advisory Board since 2012. And John and I have had intersecting interests over many years, and I've been fortunate to work with him on the corporate boards of Roche and Genentech, uh, where we, we were the two biomedical scientists on the board. I've always found uh, John's range of intellect and wisdom to be inspirational. John's received many prestigious awards, perhaps none as rewarding as his appointment by the Queen as Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire in the 2015 New Year's Honours for his services to medicine, medical research, and the life science industry. Before I turn this over to John to share his tale of the vaccine, let me remind the audience that you are welcome to submit questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to a full discussion and to answering your questions toward the end of our program. And now let me turn it over to John. Rick, thanks so much. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. And, um, uh, and can I just endorse a couple of things that you said. One is great thanks to the, the donors who've helped us and the Rockefeller uh, with our efforts in the, in the COVID crisis. Uh, but also, um, just to reiterate that it's been terrific working with you personally over many years, and, and it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to your team at the Rockefeller. So I thought that what might be best is to scamper through the story of how Oxford University ended up with a vaccine in the 
certainly in the front ranks of potential vaccines for, uh, for COVID. And, and to tell you a little bit about the background of that, but also of the story which unfolded. But to tell that story a little bit in the context of the epidemic as, as we've seen it emerge in the UK, where we've actually had a pretty tough time uh, as you have had in, in the US. And for whatever reason, probably through my connections with government, I've found I've been quite at the, really at the heart of many of the decisions taken as to how we would better manage the epidemic. And those are ongoing now with the onset of the second wave in the last few weeks. So the, the story really begins in December 9, 2019. Jeremy Farrow, who some of you will know is director of the Wellcome Trust and also the chairman of CEPI, is a great colleague. And he rang me up and he said, we've got trouble in China. It looks like there's an un, a, a pneumonia of unknown etiology that's blown up in central China. And it, this looks pretty bad to me. And, and the, the reason that one had to take close attention to that is that Jeremy had run our Oxford unit in Vietnam for many years and actually was the man on the spot for the avian flu epidemic, um, the H5N1 epidemic that had occurred in 2005, six, and, and was really an expert on emerging viral infections and epidemics or risk of epidemics. And so that was my first identification of there was a problem. And that was followed shortly thereafter when I called another uh, student of mine, ex-student of mine, George Gao, who's the head of the China CDC. And um, I, George was right in the middle, right in the heat of the action. In fact, for a long time, I thought he might not actually salvage his job, but he's done an amazing job in China. Um, and he reported that actually there was uh, a very serious epidemic going on in central China um, and that he thought it was a SARS-like virus. And in fact, shortly thereafter, he and his group sequenced the virus and it turned out to be SARS-CoV-2, which is the cause of all our difficulties. Um, it, it emerged that, that that virus probably came in part from bats, but also partly from pangolins, which are a strange um, animal, scaled mammal um, that live in, lives in Southeast Asia that the Chinese like to eat. And it was probably a combination um, of a, a virus that had passed through both those beasts that actually was affecting human population. So that, now that, that had arrived, and by the end of the first week of January, knew, we knew there were trouble. I, I think it's also worth saying that this shouldn't have been a surprise. And I was counting up the number of near misses we've had with major potential epidemics of pathogens, some of which were respiratory pathogens since 2000, since the millennium. And in fact, there have been at least eight. In fact, I suspect there have been more, but there's certainly been at least eight that have been close calls. Um, uh, a couple of flu epidemics, including the H5N1 flu epidemic, the avian flu epidemic in China, swine flu, Ebola, Zika, a couple of SARS epidemics, MERS epidemic, uh, and, uh, and also a few small tweaks of human to human transmission of Nipah and other things. So we shouldn't have been surprised that this had happened but everybody was surprised and it shows how very inadequately prepared we were for managing a, pandem a pandemic in this day and age. And uh, shame on us, that shouldn't happen again. Um, nationally, the UK was very badly prepared for this epidemic, despite me poking the NHS repeatedly in January when I could see this was coming. I was told everything's fine, don't worry, we've got lots of plans for how we'll deal with it. And by the way, it's unlikely ever to get to the UK. Um, but when it did arrive in the UK, which was late February, we found we had no PPE, we had no ventilators, we had no capacity in hospitals for testing, we had inadequate ITU space. The thing was a complete road crash. And, and we've been recovering from that lack of preparation over those two months uh, ever since. But as far as Oxford was concerned, we were, this was actually pretty interesting for us because we'd been sort of preparing for this pandemic for about 30 years with a very large program, largely based in the developing world, interested in a range of pathogens, but particularly emerging viral infections. 
uh, and that we had these interests in this domain and brought on people like Jeremy Farrow and Peter Horby, who ran the recovery study, who's our professor of emerging infections. We had a whole cadre of people who've been working on this problem for a very long time. So we felt we were in a pretty good position to contribute substantially globally to the way um, this uh, disease was managed. Um, uh, and one of the real assets that sat right in the heart of this global health emerging infections program was our vaccine program, which again went back 30 years, had multiple dimensions to it, uh, programs in the Department of Pediatrics led by Andy Pollard, who developed the, the new typhoid vaccine that's now been deployed globally, um, a strong program in HIV vaccine led by Andy McMichael, but most importantly, the Jenner Institute, which was set up by Adrian Hill about 20 years ago, really to target the development of vaccines systematically for emerging infections, but particularly emerging infections that were prominent where, where, the, where there was a prominent developing world um, um, issue. And that group had grown and expanded and, and indeed, exceeds exceeds 100 people now with a number of senior investigators about 15 senior investigators in the group and, and they have been working on everything from malaria to flu to rift valley fever ebola um sars mers the, the, and they've got programs in play for the development of vaccines in all those different domains <coughs> and the jenner has particularly specialized in challenge studies so it's something that they have made a real specialty of and that's something which i think is going to reappear in the COVID space in the not too distant future and we're uniquely positioned to do that because of our extensive experience with challenge studies in diseases like malaria where we've done quite a bit of those uh, quite quite a number of those so that the the, the jenner had originally concentrated on prime boosts methodologies focused uh, particularly on malaria with mva as being the prominent vector but they moved about 10 years ago to a non-replicating adenovirus approach. And it started with AD5, which is, you know, is a common human virus, but we're stymied a bit by the level of serological reactivity to what is a human adenovirus. And, and that compromised, in their view, the likelihood that would be able to be rolled out widely. So they moved to a chimp adenovirus um, where there was really little existing host immunity. Um, and it had a number of very significant advantages. One is it was able to create pretty strong T cell responses. And it was actually focused originally on because of its T cell capabilities, but also was able to obviously to make neutralizing antibody responses. It had strong responses in the elderly. It was easy and cheap to manufacture and relatively easy to transport because it didn't have a particularly a profound issue with very cold cold chain. So that program had been steaming along for years. They, they had worked on a large number of viruses and had been in the man with a number of them. Of course, if you work on emerging viral infections, they, the only time you can really test your vaccines is when you have an epidemic or a pandemic. So in a sense, it's a slightly morbid thing, but this was a group that had been waiting with a variety of different vaccine constructs for the opportunity to evaluate them at scale. And the leading investigator in the, in the area of uh, coronaviruses was Sarah Gilbert, who's led the charge in Oxford in this area of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And through last year, she'd been working hard on MERS vaccines, the Middle East Respiratory Virus is another member of the same coronavirus family. Um, and had been studying the use of these vaccines, both for humans, for um, epidemics of MERS, but also developing a, a camel vaccine. Almost every camel you run into in North Africa has got MERS up its nostrils. So the idea was to try and see whether one could control viral shedding from uh, camels with a systematic vaccine. So she was ready to go, and the construct actually had a spike protein in it. So there were very many similarities. So when COVID came over the hill, she was really prepared to go. And from the time we got the sequence on, I think about the 10th of January, to the time we went into man was 100 days from start to finish because we migrated the spike um, sequences across to the chimp adenovirus. 
and then work through a whole range of preclinical studies to get ourselves as confident as we could be that we would actually be able to get an efficacious uh, response using that construct. So in that 100 days, we did obviously immunogenicity studies in the mouse, but also in non-human primates and in the ferret. Uh, and we concentrated also on manufacturing CMC. We have quite a good clinical manufacturing unit uh, in the medical school, and that was used pretty much full time to optimize the methodology for growing and expanding and scaling this particular virus. So we knew a lot about the vector. The vector itself had been into about 5,000 people uh, with no adverse effects. As I said before, this vector delivers pretty good responses in the elderly, which turned out to be quite important here. It's reactogenic, and in our early studies with um, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, we had quite a trouble with people getting fevers and aches and pains. Most of that settled pretty effectively with use of a simple analgesic at the beginning, a bit of paracetamol settled, settled that down. So the reactogenicity we think is probably no uh, longer a bit of uh, a problem. So by the time we got to the end of March, we were, we were in pretty good shape. We had a vaccine candidate. We were ready to go into human trials. The regulators were terrifically supportive in terms of developing the trial protocol, which was led by Andy Pollard. And we were waiting um, for the primate studies to come back. Meanwhile, of course, the epidemic was really raging in Europe by now. It had swept through Italy and Spain uh, mercilessly, where the hospitals have become hugely overwhelmed. Half term in the UK in February brought back lots of people with the disease, and it broke out in a serious way in March. The country went into lockdown on the 23rd of March. NHS testing for the virus fell over completely. Uh, at the beginning of March, they were able to do 6,000 tests for the whole country. Uh, that rose to 7,000 before it fell back to 6,000 again. So with uh, a number of us, including Jeremy and myself, we agreed to set up large centralized labs, which uh, have now carried by far the majority of the testing in the UK. We're now up at about 240,000 tests a day all qPCR tests and so that all that was starting to happen um, but things in Oxford with the vaccine were also getting complicated and this is it, it was all fun up to a certain point but once you get to a point where you've got to manufacture uh, at scale uh, a vaccine you have to deal with the regulatory elements of the vaccine in a in a new disease you also have to think hard about how you could distribute the vaccine. We realized we were in some difficulties in terms of doing this ourselves. And so we, at that stage, started to look for a pharmaceutical partner. And we looked uh, in a number of places. I took advice from Trevor Mundell at the Gates Foundation who agreed that, that we couldn't do this on our own. It was clear the university was way out of its depth. So we, what we were hoping is that we could find a partner that would actually help us through the trials, which would have to go on on multiple continents, but also all the other things, including the commercialization of the vaccine. Um, uh, and the risks, the reputational risks were now large because as the epidemic had blown up, everybody was saying we need a vaccine. And of course, the only people really with an advanced, advanced vaccine at this stage was, were, were, were us, to be honest. And, and we were, we, we were, pretty much ahead of almost everybody else. Um, some of the RNA vaccines caught up quite quickly because you can make them very quickly, but we had much more knowledge about how this vaccine was likely to work. So we were actually in the spotlight in a pretty uh, unhelpful way. Um, so one of the things we had to do was we had to decide who we were gonna partner with. A lot of the obvious favorites, people like GSK who have largest vaccine program in the world had already decided to make their own vaccine. Uh, they were working with Sanofi, another vaccine program. Pfizer had partnered with BioNTech. Uh, there weren't that many partners around. And meanwhile, the UK government was very engaged and said, actually, if you guys are going to make a partnership in this, we really want you to do it with a UK company. 
because we are concerned about vaccine nationalism. We're afraid that we'll partner and won't be able to get any of a vaccine, any of a vaccine that was made and has been supported by, third, for, by 30 years of research activity in the UK. So uh, through a, a combination of events, originally led by Adrian Hill, but then uh, through my relationship with Pascal Sorier uh, at AstraZeneca, we, we sat down with uh, AstraZeneca and over a very short period of time, drafted out a, a, a term sheet and then ultimately a contract to, to make this vaccine with them as our partners. And it's one of the probably most important things in the story that we were able to drive through that deal in a relatively short time frame, So it didn't disrupt the progress uh, on the development of the vaccine. Now you won't be surprised being an academic institution that the academic inventors of this vaccine had particular issues about a deal to be done with the pharma company. And they had two particular issues, which um, fortunately we were able to uh, align with AstraZeneca. One was the academics wanted to be sure that uh, if this vaccine was made and produced, that it would be distributed and sold during the pandemic at a, on a not-for-profit basis, because they didn't want to be seen to be making money out of a global health crisis. And I have to say the university was completely behind them. Fortunately, Pascal and AstraZeneca were very much on board with that. And we thought other vaccine companies would follow. They haven't actually, as it happened. But I, I have to say, I'm not embarrassed by the fact that we're going to be doing this uh, if it works in the first year on a not-for-profit basis. If it becomes a seasonal coronavirus vaccine and is sold every year, then um, AstraZeneca will obviously sell it uh, to return some of the money to shareholders. But the second thing that the academics involved were very uh, uh, emphatic about is that they wanted that the develop they wanted the developing world not to be left behind. They didn't want this to be a vaccine for the developed world when the developing world was less struggling because it was clear at that stage that this disease was going to be as bad in the developing world as it was uh, in the developed world. And they uh, insisted that AstraZeneca made every effort to try and uh, expand and develop their uh, manufacturing capabilities as widely as they could. And again, AstraZeneca has been terrific in that regard. We're currently sitting on manufacturing licenses and uh, subcontracts that will deliver about 3 billion doses of vaccine, which I accept is not enough to cover the whole world, but it's enough to cover most of the major continents um, uh, outside China, where we're still discussing with the Chinese as to whether they want access to this. So. The, the academics were pretty happy about those negotiations. And in fact, that relationship has continued to be extremely uh, strong and powerful. So about this time, as we were signing the AstraZeneca deal, the primate data came in. This was done by the NIH, I have to say, on our behalf. We were obviously involved, but they led the study. We'd studied the immunogenicity in mice where we saw strong IgG titers as well as strong T cell responses with LA spot studies, lots of neutralizing antibodies and a strong Th1 high gamma interferon response with a low IL-4 and IL-10 response, which was what we hoped we would see to avoid um, um, antibody dependent enhancement, which as you know, is largely a Th2 mediated phenomena. We, we then were able to see the output of the rhesus macaque studies where we had six animals in each arm. Those studies were actually much better than I thought. I thought all we really needed to do was see that it didn't cause enhancement in the macaques, which would have pulled a grinding halt to this particular vaccine. But instead we saw really pretty remarkable data with the absence of particularly mnemonic pathology in the vaccinated animals, unlike those who were uh, uh, in the control group. Uh, there was high IgG and neutralizing antibody levels in the macaques, also high T cell LA, LA spots. Uh, and the challenge in these animals is massive. So this was a pretty in interesting uh, example of a, of a challenge study that really gave us an indication that this was quite possibly going to be efficacious. It didn't, however, uh, influence the difference in viral shedding from the, naso, from the nasopharynx in, in these animals, which is an interesting phenomena. That's been seen before 
in these circumstances and may have been the result of the very high loading dose or maybe a feature of the ultimately of the vaccine which needs very careful attention because that might mean that the vaccine prevents severe disease but doesn't ultimately prevent transmission and that's something that of course we're very attuned to. It's worth just spending a couple of minutes on the immunology to this disease and then I'll tell you a little bit about the further studies that we've done with the vaccine and then we can turn it over to questions. But as you know that the the immune response to this vaccine is really uh, at, at least twofold. The antibody response occurs within 14 days. The IgG antibody response within 14 days re reaches a peak at about 28 days. One generates very strong neutralizing antibodies. They're pretty much all to spike, but it does generate good neutralizing antibodies. Um, and um, those antibodies appear not to be particularly durable. Now, there's some mixed data on this that I suspect depends a little bit on the ELISA that you use to measure these, but it looks in broad terms like these antibodies decline and wane at a rate of about 10% a month, which means that, you know, six to eight months later, there ain't that much antibody left. And we're seeing lots of examples now of people who had antibody who don't have antibody anymore. Um, now the SARS-CoV-1 antibodies lasted about two years, but what's interesting is the SARS-CoV-1 T cells lasted about 15 years. In fact, they're still steaming on. So there is a very important story about T cell immunity in this disease, which wasn't, I think, widely recognized initially, but there's been a lot of papers, including from our groups, our groups in Oxford that show that there's quite a lot of cross reactivity between peptides from this virus and other endemic coronaviruses. There's quite a high level of existing T cell immunity in populations. And that may account for why this disease is actually relatively benign in young people. But when your T cell starts to pack up, start to pack up from T cell senescence in elderly, more elderly people, you get much more severe disease. And that's where most of the mortality is coming from. So there are, I think, a number of data points in here that suggest this is like the T cells are likely to be very important for the mediation of immunity to this disease. And as a result, a good vaccine should really have a powerful T cell component to it. And uh, not everybody's publishing the T cell data, uh, but we're pretty optimistic that ours is quite good. Uh, there's a little associated side story to this, which is to, uh, to, just to emphasize one of the comments Rick made, there is this weird thing going on in Southeast Asia that nobody can really explain. Remember that Vietnam and Northern Thailand border right on the southern edge of China. These are pretty large population masses in these groups. They live in pretty dense urban populations as well as having pretty wild country in those bits of the world. It turns out that, remember this is a, vag, uh, this is a virus that came from bats and pangolins. The world's grand central station for bats in the world is Northern Vietnam. There are more species of bat in Northern Vietnam than there is anywhere else. Lots of them are laden with uh, SARS-like viruses. And most of the pangolins that they eat in Wuhan also come from North Vietnam. So I suspect this viral infection may well have come from North Vietnam into China. And what's interesting, of course, is that it's also possible that these viruses have been circulating that population and they may have pr pretty profound levels of T cell immunity. And we're, we're, uh, one of the things we were interested in, we have a unit, of course, in Vietnam that's very active, as well as one in Laos and one in Thailand. And we were anticipating getting lots of samples. We've had almost no samples from them because they haven't seen much active disease at all. And I wonder whether there's a story there to be pursued. But that's, I think this is all related to the fact that if you're making a vaccine, you need to be very attuned to what the what the natural immune responses to the virus are. And it looks very clear that this is not just an antibody response that's important, but also a T cell response. So by this time, the, 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 uh, the deal had been done. The primate data looked pretty strong. We were ready to get going. AstraZeneca had, had agreed to manufacture at risk. Uh, and so we started our phase one and two studies, and those we did in a hurry. We tried to be really careful about maintaining real care about safety. That was the reason we wanted a readout from the primate study before we started the clinical studies because we were well aware of anti antibody uh, dependent enhancement in some of these diseases. And so we've been quite careful up to the time we got into man, but we then 
move quite quickly on the phase one studies. We modified the protocol so we could get phase one done quickly, which we did, and then we moved pretty rapidly into phase two. And the results of that, uh, the, the first thousand patients were published in July in the Lancet, um, and the headlines there were, pr again, pretty promising. The levels of IgG in these people were um, uh, at 30 to 40 days, roughly the same as those you see in convalescent plasma from people who'd had the natural infection. There were lots of neutralizing antibodies and they were neutralizing almost regardless of the assay you used. As you know, there's a real problem with standardization of neutralizing antibody assays in COVID. So we did several of them and it all, it looked pretty good there. And we also had very strong T cell responses. Um, and it looked based on a very small set that we got a pretty substantial boost in all those responses if we gave them a second dose. So we started to rather more systematically give two doses of the virus. We've still got a subpopulation which only has a single dose. And the study, original study was intended to be 10,000 people. We expanded it because we could see trouble by May. We could see trouble coming in the UK because the disease rates were falling. But by that stage, we'd expanded and started to set up sites in Brazil where the disease was starting to really fire off. We started sites, yeah, we started a site in South Africa where again, we expected there to be a lot of disease, which there was. The trial size is now expanded to 18,000. About 60% have had two doses. And now that we've got a second wave in the UK, we're, I think, pretty confident we're going to get enough incident cases. It's a, it's a, it's a vaccine. It's not a, it's not a placebo controlled trial. This is controlled by another vaccine in an adenovirus, a meningococcal vaccine. Um, so we have a, we can measure incident rates in that population. It's actually probably a slightly better than a placebo control arrangement because everybody who gets either the control or the real vaccine feels like they've had a vaccine. So people don't know which vaccine they've got. And, and the, the crucial thing will be to get enough incident cases that allows us to run this out. Um, the, there's manufacturing going on at scale in the UK. Similarly, the US I now have a big contract with AstraZeneca. There's activity, of course, in Brazil. Serum Institute in India is making a billion doses and have apparently already made 100 million doses. The Europeans are making 400, um, uh, they're making 400 million doses. And um, there's a, a program in Russia and also in uh, South America. So there, there are a large number of manufacturing activities going on. Uh, in the UK, the only condition that the UK government had for us doing this deal was that they would have security of supply as the first priority which is probably not an unreasonable um, uh, position to take. So we are waiting for a readout. Um, we'll, I think, pretty certainly get that um, before Christmas. It may be quite a bit before Christmas, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm obviously not privy to the data on incident rates, and neither is anybody else except a very small statistical group who are looking at the time to stop the study. Um, we don't really, I mean, we'd like to be the first guys uh, with a <laughs> successful vaccine, but the honest truth is um, we don't, we're not fussed who gets there first. It would be really good if we had multiple vaccines, um, and it looks like we may well get multiple vaccines. I, I have a view that it may not take that much to put people, push people across the line to make them highly protected against this virus simply because there is quite a lot of existing adaptive immunity to this virus already in people, and you may not need to do much about that. We, of course, in the UK are also making plans for what do we do if the vaccines don't work? That would be bad, um, but I think you have to entertain all possibilities because although we'd like to be optimistic, it does on average take eight years, as you know, to make a vaccine. And uh, we've been going about eight months on this one. So don't be surprised if some of this stuff doesn't work. Um, but if it doesn't work, we're currently working on many of the things that Rick mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Recovery, of course, is the great success. Again, run out of Oxford for randomized trials. We recruited 12,000 patients and did the dexamethasone work, which is a interesting, as, a, as I think, a really 
interesting mechanism of action. Um, and obviously eliminated hydroxychloroquine and ritonavir from the list. The recovery is now working on, um, they just started with a neutralizing monoclonal antibody and with convalescent sera, which they're doing at scale, as well as with inhaled beta interferon. Um, and they've got a couple of other molecules coming through. And, and finally, the other way we're preparing for trouble, even between now and the time of the vaccine, is to pursue the testing methodology that Rick mentioned in his presentation. We think that testing is going to be really important. We've got a plan to move to 5 million tests a day. A lot of those will be lateral flow tests. We're validating those at the moment. We've got four pretty good ones, um, we think, that we'll be able to roll out at scale. So that's all a game on to try and deal with this virus. But I think all of us are hoping a lot that we're going to get a, a, a vaccine of one sort or another, and ideally more than one vaccine, so that we can start to take the edge off this epidemic before the end of the year. Rick, I think I'll stop there, and, and we, could, we could spend uh, 15 minutes taking questions, if that's helpful. Well, we might spend an hour, so, but uh, <laughs> thank you, John, for that uh, terrific presentation. So uh, one of the questions that comes up in the context of this particular virus is uh, that the most serious effects are in the elderly population. And that raises the question of how uh, susceptible will the elderly be to responding to uh, the vaccine in a way that will give them protection? Is there data from the early studies uh, that yeah. give a hint to that? Yeah, we just generated the we just generated the boost data on elderly people with the vaccine, and they get a good boost from the vaccine. So I think with two doses, they should be fine. And we've also got there, we've got a track record with this, with other viruses in the elderly. Adenovirus works pretty well in the elderly. It probably needs two doses. You probably need a boost, but it should be, it should be okay. Uh, again, that was something that I, people were rightly worried about because a vaccine that doesn't work in the over 60s ain't much good in this disease. So it's a, it's a very fair point. Great. And using, in that you're using a, uh, uh, a virus other than the native or an attenuated version of the native virus. Uh, you commented that uh, the effect uh, may wane after a year or so. Uh, and so when you're coming back with uh, a virus that has an adeno uh, backbone, what do you think there's a risk that uh, you'll, you'll in, in third and fourth doses uh, just neutralize the incoming virus and not be able to get a boost out of it. Yeah, so, so first of all, we were worried about that even with the boost dose. Um, and, and you do get a few antibodies to adenovirus for sure. So it's not as if your immune system is ignorant of the fact you've got adeno, but the boost seems to still have a very powerful effect. So that's all we were worried about. But if you get a year from now and you need to come back and give people an annual coronavirus vaccine, that's an interesting question. Adrian and the Jenner guys have done that experiment with other vaccines, and they find that although it attenuates a bit, it doesn't attenuate that much. And their view is it probably still is a go as, a, as an annual coronavirus vaccine. I think we'll have to wait and see on whether that is actually correct, but they would argue quite actively that it will probably work as an annual coronavirus top-up, which I suspect we're going to need. If you look, you know, well, so we in the time frame from the, our vaccinations to the, our immune, immune, immunogenicity studies, we saw no waning of the antibody response. But I'll be very surprised if, that, if that's true over a longer period of time. And I'm predicting that we're going to have to come back at this thing at, on regular intervals. And that may be an argument for uh, having multiple different uh, uh, vaccines so that uh, you wouldn't be confounded by cross-reactivity. Yeah, that's, it's, it's exactly right. And, and actually, you know, I think one of the interesting things is whether these vaccines will actually, whether you get the best response if you mix and match. So you might start with adeno and boost with mRNA, or you might start with mRNA and boost with adeno. I mean, there's a lot of those interesting questions. They're essentially immunological questions, but they, there will be a host of opportunities to do that, I think. And I think one of the best ways to do that will be challenge studies. And we're pretty interested in in fact, we're making the virus now. We're going to get going on that. So, 
Yeah, the, we'll leave aside for the moment the, uh, the ethics of doing challenge studies when uh, the uh, therapeutics are not uh, so great yet, but... Uh, yeah, but they're coming on. We won't do it till we have a good salvage therapy, but I, I like the looks of some of these monoclonal antibodies. I think they might be good now. Yeah, terrific. So you commented that uh, the vaccine, the, the Oxford vaccine did not prevent uh, the upper respiratory uh, infection so that they were still uh, able to shed virus after the vaccine. Uh, raising the question of uh, whether the uh, vaccine is giving you a, a, a mucosal protection by an IgA response. Is there, are there thoughts about how you might uh, uh, try to uh, uh, provide mucosal protection? Yeah, so I, I think this is a really interesting question. I, it's, I think I, I don't want to overinterpret the primate data because the primates, I mean, this is a weird study. They're putting massive amounts of virus in nose and mouth. And, uh, and, and then they sacrifice the animals. So you don't actually see the evolution beyond, a, I think it was a four week time frame. So you don't really see what's going to go on in the, in the longer term. So, but I do think people have jumped to assumptions about what these vaccines are actually going to do and what you actually want them to do. So ideally, you'd like them to sterilize completely everybody who gets them. Uh, that would be the perfect answer. But they may not be able to do that, to be honest, and they may only really be able to stop disease progression to severe disease. And, and I think we're going to have to wait and see how that plays out in the studies. Great. So, so as you commented, uh, there are a variety of uh, different uh, vaccine strategies being taken uh, for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, you know these range from attenuated uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is being pursued uh, in China, uh, the mRNA lipid uh, uh, constructs uh, that are being pursued by Moderna and Pfizer, uh, protein subunit uh, vaccines by uh, uh, Sanofi and GSK. Uh, and then nanoparticles, DNA plasmids, self-amplifying RNAs. There's quite a quite a uh, range. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, likely uh, uh, successes and uh, things that you wouldn't hold out so much hope for? Yeah. So, so I, 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 I think, and looking only at the the immunogenicity data, which has come out of almost all those platforms now, the immunogenicity data in all of them looks pretty good. The T cell data is a bit, the antibody data is very good. The T cell data is a bit scrap here. A lot of it hasn't been properly published yet. So it may be there, but we just haven't seen it. But I, I would give all those platforms that you mentioned a pretty decent chance of succeeding, I have to say. And I, and I, I think some of the real issues may relate not so much to the vaccine and whether they work or not, but can you, this is a global disease. And although everybody likes to make sure that their home team, the home population gets vaccinated, the truth is unless you can manage some kind of control of this disease on a global basis, it's going to come roaring back and causing all kinds of trouble. So I think this issue about is it cheap enough to make to deploy to the developing world or not? Can you get it there without a massively complicated cold chain? Can you manufacture it at scale and easily? Uh, then I think adenovirus, the, both the Janssen adenovirus and our adenovirus are probably in pretty good shape, but so are the conventional protein adjuvant combinations that GSK and Sanofi are making. That looks pretty good. And the Novavax thing also looks pretty interesting and probably deployable. So I think there will be horses for courses in this, but I think, you know, keeping our, our, our interest is making sure the UK population gets vaccinated but also to make sure, you know, the guys in India get a vaccine, the guys in South Africa get a vaccine, the guys in Brazil get a vaccine. You know, we, we can take that view because we're an academic institution and we never make any money anyway, so what's the big deal? But, um, uh, but you know, if you're, if you're wearing a commercial hat, you might take a different view. Yeah, I was impressed that uh, the mRNA vaccines, uh, the Pfizer vaccine requires a cold chain of minus 70 and uh, the uh, uh, Moderna vaccine uh, minus 20. And I saw a comment uh, in the press uh, attributed to uh, people from uh, one of the companies that said, well, after we get approval, we'll modify the formulation uh, and uh, the, to get rid of that uh, need. And that uh, certainly gave me the willies. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that's gonna be challenging. I think getting, um, 
getting a cold chain at minus 70 to um, sub-Saharan Africa is going to be pretty complicated. So um, obviously, given the intense pressure to uh, have the vaccine uh, uh, come to market as uh, soon as possible has uh, prompted uh, uh, certain people to uh, insist that it be approved uh, uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of concern about how that uh, plays out. I know that uh, all of the phase three trials have provisions for taking an early look at uh, the data. Uh, and I assume that uh, everybody is doing their early looks in a way that would have a lower bound of uh, roughly 50%. I think that's what the FDA uh, is using. Uh, and it's, it was striking that uh, um, that could happen very quickly uh, if you have something that works reasonably uh, well. Uh, I think uh, the AstraZeneca trial is taking uh, a look after 75 events. Uh, and uh, if you hit the, uh, uh, the lower bound of 95% uh, confidence interval of greater than 50%, in principle, you'd say, okay, we could go forward, but you wouldn't have much data on efficacy across age ranges, nor a lot of necessarily a lot of safety data. Uh, what are your concerns about uh, approval and speed to uh, wide use? Yeah, so, so I think this is... I, I, just to be crystal clear, you would not want to be the head of the MHRA, our equivalent to your FDA, because they're going to get landed with this problem. They're going to have to make a decision. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's a bit early to say how AstraZeneca is going to cut the data. I, I, I think the inclination is to go longer rather than shorter, particularly as we're getting a lot of events now. But that discussion is still ongoing, actually, and it's a dialogue, to be honest, with regulators. Nobody's, nobody's had a peak, and um, I, I think, you know, there are issues about taking peaks, as you know, from a statistical perspective. So my personal view is you go further and you don't take any peaks. You just do it, and you hope for, you, 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 obviously, you monitor the, the, the incident rate, or you get somebody to do that, and then you, you come up with what you think is going to be a powered study, and off you go. Um, I, I think the, the real challenge is going to be um, what does a regulator do with these kind of data packages? So we, you know, we're going to have safety in twenty thousand people. We've got, you know, we've, it's been into five thousand other people around the place. But that, you know, in vaccine terms, that's not a massive safety database. It's, you know, it's okay, but it's not massive. Um, you, you, you probably want more, and 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 I don't see that any country is going to roll this out to everybody on day one anyway. And I suspect the regulators are going to say, okay, we've seen enough to let you do a bit. So you can have healthcare workers, care home workers, and the elderly as a starter for 10, but you're not going into anybody else till we've seen another, you know, 200,000 people have been vaccinated and we know that it's safe. And then you can, and then you can go from there. So I won't be at all surprised to see this. The regulators take one bite at a time. Because I, I, you know, I think that if you're if you're being cautious, that's probably the right way to go. Now the problem is that once you've kind of given a green light, then there are all kinds of other hazards because lots of other regulators are going to say, "Oh well, off we go." And you know what? You can't control what's going to happen in many jurisdictions, and the the urge to get this out to people is going to be large, even if it's a political requirement. So I think it's. It's a very complicated, the regulation of this is very complicated. And as I say, I'm really glad I'm not the UK regulator because they're going to, they're really on the hot spot. So uh, your trial is uh, using a, uh, as a, as a control, another uh, infectious agent that uh, may mount uh, a reaction. Uh, is there any concern that uh, getting an innate immune response uh, to that virus might uh, uh, in partially inhibit uh, the infectivity of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. yeah, we thought about that. It's, a, I mean, I think it's an interesting theoretical question. And there's, there's been, a, there's been some real-world studies that originally suggested that people who had had um, one of the vaccines, I think it was Shingrix vaccine, were protected, but they. When they went back and looked at the data, it didn't hold up. Uh, I, look, it's, it's, it's a risk. The, the reason I think it's important, though, is that, you know, if you get an injection of saline, you know you've not had the vaccine. 
Yeah. And your behavior is going to be different than if you get, you know, you get an arm that's swollen up like this and a headache and a fever. And I, I, I think those behavioral things will, will, will actually change the, the, the way you approach what you do in day-to-day -day life and your exposure to the virus. So look, there's no perfect answer to this. I think, you know, you, I don't think you can get, but we chose to go with a control vaccine. That's what we, that's what we thought was the best thing. So in the press, there's been a, a lot of coverage of uh, this reported case of transverse myelitis and another patient who uh, had what uh, has been adjudicated apparently as a new onset MS uh, case. And uh, I gather uh, the trial has been uh, resumed uh, elsewhere, but uh, the understanding in the US is that it's still on hold. Is that your understanding and any insight into that? Yeah, so, so I'm obviously, that's all patient confidential information, and I'm pretty cross that any information about any patient has got out, and it has. So, so I, I don't really want to talk about it except to say that you have data monitoring and safety boards for a reason. That's their job. I like to let them get on with their job, and, you know, if they think there's an issue, they need to say so, and if they don't, they also need to say so. So that process has worked pretty well in the UK. I assume that there's this, an equivalent data monitoring board in the US, which is, is, is adjudicating now, I think. But there, there are a whole load of people expressing a view about this who don't know anything about it. So I just, you know, be nice if they put a sock in it for a while and let the, the, the MSB go on, get on with it, so. Well, obviously, uh, here in particular, there's concern that uh, the vaccine is going to be approved without adequate attention to safety uh, and not necessarily be made by uh, the FDA. You may have seen uh, last week that uh, the head of uh, HHS uh, said, you guys don't make uh, any of the rules anymore. They have to come centrally from us, which uh, makes us somewhat more susceptible to uh, moving forward regardless. Yeah, so I think we're in a really tricky time here, and that is that the public's trust in vaccinology generally is going to be highly dependent on how we all behave in this thing. Yeah. And as a result, I mean, we have really, I mean, our safety monitoring is really, really thorough. We make a real effort to do it well. We were very careful about the Brazilian and South African sites. That they could maintain a standard that was at least as good as what we were able to maintain. And we've, you know, we've got a system in place and the fact that, you know, we've had, there, there has been an issue, I don't know what the issue was, but, uh, it, it, you know, it was flagged, it was managed. And I, I think what we're trying to do is trying to keep politicians out of this decision making. It's really got to be done in a, in a completely professional way, as you would with any other vaccine. I, I think, you know, we're, we, we, we run real risks if we cut corners on this stuff because people will say, God, I don't think that's safe and I'm not having the vaccine. And then you're really in trouble. Yeah. Do, uh, do you have uh, views on how efficacious the vaccine needs to be to be uh, clinically useful? Because I can imagine uh, the bar continuing to go down if you have uh, any efficacy, but uh, from a uh, practical standpoint, uh, what's, what's the point at which you'd say, nah, this isn't worth uh, distributing? Yeah, so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think 50% is too low. That's my view. I think it needs to be higher than that. Um, but I, others are making, are going to adjudicate on that. It's not going to be me who decides where that's going to sit. But I, but I you know, look, we want to, there are multiple vaccines in play. They're, they're going to have differential um, efficacies, I suspect. And, you know, if, if, we, if we can't get a, a, a vaccine with efficacy more than 50%, I don't think we're doing very well. So, I, 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 you know, what we don't want is a half-baked vaccine that doesn't really do what we need it to do. And that, you know, that would be a problem. And that's another problem with rushing out the distribution of this thing before you've actually had a really close look at what's happening. The, so my, the last question is, uh, what is your guess uh, with a crystal ball as to uh, when the general public will likely begin to start seeing access uh, to, this, uh, to uh, this vaccine, assuming that uh, things go well? Uh, and when will children be candidates for vaccination? Yeah, so... Um... So it's got to work first, Rick. So 
that's that's the that's the big hurdle. Okay, we'll start uh, there. Assume that that assume that it works, that it passes uh, muster. Well, I, you know, look, I think you know, by the, certainly by the end of the year, it'll be accessible. Um, uh, I think if 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 it if it comes through in the way we think it will, it'll be it's something in that order. So um, you know, we're we're I I think with the level of disease in the UK at the moment, we're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of people exposed. There's a lot of exposure still in Brazil. We've moved sites in Brazil to get more. So I think we're going to get, we're going to get enough incident cases. We haven't done any studies in young kids. And we did that intentionally because we thought we'd start with the population, the elder population. Well, somebody's got to do, uh, somebody's got to do older, uh, sorry, somebody's got to do younger kids. We will do it later. It'll be another study. We'll have to start it when we finish this one. But will not be in a position to treat pediatric populations for, um, for the immediate future. So John, you'll be impressed to know that there are a ton of uh, uh, questions that still remain in the hopper, uh, but uh, given the time, I think uh, we better close our discussion uh, now. Uh, I wanna thank uh, John Bell for a spectacular overview of the work at Oxford and in the UK and a brilliant discussion of what we've learned from the pandemic and the challenges that lie ahead. To everyone in our audience, uh, as you've heard, history is being made as research institutions, companies, and nations work together to deliver vaccines that uh, we all hope will confer immunity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Rockefeller's participation in the response has been made possible by many of you uh, who provided an unprecedented outpouring of support uh, for our fund for COVID-19 research. And we can't thank you enough for your generous contributions. There's still a lot uh, that lies ahead. Uh, please see the next slide for more information about how you can contribute and help us uh, combat the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna thank everyone for participating today. You can view recordings of this talk and our past virtual discussions on our website, where you will also find future events as they become posted. Thank you very much for participating this afternoon. Good evening.